Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And uh, thank you, Alexandra, for the introduction and also the invitation. It's an honor to be able to share my talk with everyone here this evening. I'm Amber, and I believe that heritage buildings make you a better person. When my brother and I were little, our mom would come up with different ways of making the time we spent together, you know, fun, interesting. Most parents took their kids to the playground, but not my mom. <laughs> my mom took us to gardens and old buildings. Mind you, we loved it because every outing was an adventure. I've been interested in architecture since I was maybe five or six years old. I remember being handed this book about public buildings. This was during a family event, and it was purely a distraction tactic to give the grown-ups a few minutes of respite from little me. But to be fair, it worked. I spent the entire evening just leafing through the pages of that book, completely transfixed. Now, I'm an architect and civil engineer by profession, which unfortunately makes me part of the problem. Our architectural landscape today is vastly different to the one that I remember growing up as that little girl. And it's frustrating to say, but the change has not been for the better. That said, I love my job. I really do, I love it, I love designing, I love being on site, I guess some things never change. And I love witnessing this transition where the thing that I imagined becomes reality. But the projects that I love working on most are heritage building projects. I like to work with old buildings. So, although the interest I have in architecture was born that day I studied the buildings in that book, my passion for it developed on those outings with my mom and my brother. I will happily spend hours exploring any heritage building anywhere in the world, but I have to admit, I have a soft spot for Maltese vernacular architecture. I think that there's something magical about these buildings. They've got um, a magnetic energy that just draws you in and enchants you. That said, these buildings can perform a different kind of magic, because inherent in their skin and bones are passive environmental design strategies. I call them PEDs. And these magical PEDs have the power to make the spaces that we inhabit comfortable. And consequently, they make us more energy efficient. Now, why is this important? Can I get a show of hands? I hope you're all going to play along. Um, who here grew up without an AC in summer? Okay, all right, quite a few of you. And of those who raised their hand, how many of you still make do without an AC? Okay, far fewer. And yet, we've all heard of the climate crisis, According to the European Commission, the building industry is the single largest energy consumer in the EU and one of the largest carbon dioxide emitters. Through construction, demolition, restoration and reuse, buildings are responsible for about 40% of energy consumed and 36% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it stands to reason that we should be doing everything in our power to make our buildings as energy efficient as possible. Well, we're not, but the good news is that there are many ways in which we can, and today I'm going to discuss two. Firstly, we can reduce the rate of demolition and construction. Now, I know that might sound a little strange coming from an architect, but it makes sense, right? If we demolish less, then we generate less waste. And if we build less, then we consume less energy during the construction process. Okay, so what's next? How do we make do? Well, we tap into this magical resource, heritage buildings. 
Secondly, we reduce the amount of energy that we, as building occupants, consume. Now, I can almost hear some of you thinking, you know, Amber, that's easy, no problem. We'll just stick a PV panel on our roofs and we're sorted. Well, absolutely not. Apart from the impact that that has had on our urban skylines, any retrofit carries the risk of triggering something called the rebound effect. Now, the rebound effect is a bit like when you scoff down a big plate of pasta after a particularly intense gym session. It's your brain telling you, you know what, we are now more energy efficient, so we can stand to consume a bit more energy. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't look towards renewables. We absolutely should, we absolutely must but it need not be our first or only port of call. To reduce our energy demand, we should spend our time in buildings which are comfortable, buildings which maximize natural light, buildings which are cooler in summer and warmer in winter, buildings which are inherently designed to improve our health and well-being. And guess what? Heritage buildings do just that. If they're used correctly, these buildings perform very well environmentally, and that's because our predecessors designed them to adapt harmoniously to the Mediterranean climate and context. How? I'll give you some examples. The size and configuration of windows on a facade was very well thought out to maximize cross-ventilation and the timber louvers were shut when the sun was at its strongest to reduce heat gain. But how often have you heard of these windows being widened or shifted without an understanding of how that impacts the building's dynamics? And how often have you heard someone complain, oh, those timber louvers, those persiani, they're so expensive to maintain. But what's their added benefit? Double skin, cavity-filled walls, about a meter thick, give or take, sometimes thicker. They give us excellent thermal insulation. How often have we seen these walls narrowed to increase the area of a room? High ceilings, just like this one. They allow hot air to rise and the room to remain cooler. But how often are these double height rooms split to fit in an extra floor? The central courtyard, my favorite amplifies natural light and ventilation, allows hot air to escape. Often it comes with a south-facing loggia that shades the adjacent rooms from direct sunlight. But how often do we see these skylights enclosed with a fixed glass ceiling, which essentially turns them into greenhouses? Can't forget our underground spaces. Wells collect and store rainwater for reuse and externally ventilated basements create a buffer against humidity at the ground floor, provided they remain externally ventilated. Do you know those open metal grills on the pavement, the ones that make walking in heels particularly difficult? <laughs> so those actually play a very important role. Um, and yes, it's inconvenient when rubbish falls through the open grill, but closing them off means the basement can no longer breathe. And the consequence of that is rising damp at ground floor. Last two. The finishes. Internal walls were whitewashed to reflect and maximize natural light, and the traditional flooring, uh, stone slabs, marble, cement tiles, those work as passive cooling mechanisms, which can easily be countered in winter by laying down a thick carpet. Maybe some of you remember your parents or grandparents using this technique. And last but certainly not least, external spaces. Indigenous trees and vegetation were planted in gardens, sometimes to provide food, but always to provide shade. Passive environmental design strategies, PEDs, were not intended for energy efficiency. Electricity wasn't even an option at the time, but they were intended for comfort. They came together to create buildings that adapt harmoniously to the Mediterranean climate and context. Buildings that improve the quality of life of the people who inhabit them. A few years ago, I was studying one such building when I came across really interesting behavior, something that stuck with me. 
one particular office suite, it was maybe three or four rooms, had an open loggia onto a private garden. And the people who worked in this office would grab their desk, grab their chair, grab their laptop, and set up a workspace in this loggia almost every day. Now, the rooms in this building were absolutely beautiful, but the loggia provided a far more pleasant workspace, one which was still environmentally friendly, but was also biophilic, which means that it strengthened their connection with nature. The term biophilia is made up of two ancient Greek words, bio, which means nature, and philia, which means love. So biophilia can be translated to an innate love of nature. It's the idea that deep within our subconscious, deep within our ancient brains, is a biological need to be surrounded by nature. We are happier, healthier, and more able to lead meaningful lives when we feel connected to nature. So we should start integrating nature into our buildings. Well, actually, the practice of biophilic design, the practice of um, integrating nature, natural concepts, natural materials, natural analogues into our built environment, our urban spaces, our architecture, our interiors. It's not a new concept. That's a picture of Imnidra temples built in the fourth millennium BC. So that's about 6,000 years ago, give or take. The neatly pitted masonry facade reminds you of a honeycomb. And that's a 5,000-year-old altar from the Tarshin Temples complex. The engravings remind us of fishtails, thorns. These biomorphic forms and patterns are symbolic references to nature. Fast forward a couple of thousand years, and we're in Valletta, St. John's Square and Palace Square, just around the corner. The fountains introduce the presence of water. They evoke the sense of sound, the sense of touch. They remind us of our connection to the Mediterranean. About 100 years later, Floriana was designed as the Garden City. Perhaps intuitively, our ancestors recognized, understood the benefits of biophilic design, but today we have proof. In educational facilities, research has shown that test scores are 3.3 times better in biophilic environments. Performance improves by between 10 to 14 percent when there is a plant in the room, and the impact of ADHD is reduced. The learning rate of students in naturally lit classrooms is up to 26 percent better than that of students in artificially lit classes. And the same goes for workspaces. One study showed that employees in offices with access to daylight and views of nature took far less sick days. Another proved that employees' call handling rates per hour were 6% better when they could look out towards nature for 40 seconds or more. It's because our brains switch to restoration mode. In healthcare facilities, Professor Ehrlich showed that of a group of patients recovering from gallbladder surgery, those in a room with a view of trees made fewer nurse calls, took less pain medication, and recovered a whole day earlier than those in a room with a view of a brick wall. And in a separate study, he proved that patients who were shown a picture of nature before or after cardiac surgery had lower heart rates, lower blood pressure, and faster recovery times than patients who were shown a blank page. Biophilic design improves our mood. It reduces our stress, it lowers our cortisol. You are more likely to be kinder, more generous, more creative, when you feel connected to nature. So yes, heritage buildings, which are inherently biophilic, can make you a better person. My fear is that today we have lost our instinct 
for incorporating nature into the buildings that we spend 90% of our lives in. But through biophilic design, we can rediscover the ability to build and live in harmony with our climate. And through sensitive restoration and reuse, we can re-establish our relationship with our built heritage. By combining PEDS and biophilic design with innovative technology, we can evolve our architectural identity positive way. Going forward, if you're ever lucky enough to be the caretakers of a heritage building, I sincerely hope that you'll remember some of this, you'll keep it in mind, <laughs> and that you'll join me in being part of the solution and not the problem.